show. I'm Barry Louise Switzen, and my show is The Woman's Connection. The Woman's Connection is a program about women who've had challenges and obstacles in their lives, but more important, it's what they've done about it. Our guest today I met at the Women's Annual, well, sorry, it's the Annual Convention for Women in Communication. I had a plate in one hand, a champagne glass in another hand, and I tried to juggle them both to shake her hand. Well, she came to my rescue. She said, let me help you with that. That's what I do for a living. And what have I ever been grateful? I've shared it to m countless number of times with other people. And today, we're going to share it with you. It turns out our guest has a company called Etiquette International. She's made a business out of this, helping other people. But it's how she got into the business in the first place that I think is very fascinating. And I know I'm at the head of the class when it comes to the reasons why. I'd like to introduce Helga Kleinkenberg and learn more about Etiquette International. Welcome. Well, thank you for inviting me here. It's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you. I'm so glad you could make it. How did you ever start a company called Etiquette International, and what exactly do you do? Well, I do write about business etiquette. I did write a book about it. But also, I go into companies, and I work with individuals or with groups of people and work on business etiquette, basic American business etiquette or international business etiquette if they're going on a trip to, say, Japan or to France or to Germany, and prepare them for it so that they don't end up with foot and mouth disease <laughs> while they're over there. <laughs> that sounds like me, with mm. foot and mouth Boy, I can stay here and uh, <laughs> be with foot and mouth disease. What are the differences in cultures between, let's say, Japan, America, France? Because you've lived in so many different countries. I've lived in a few, that's true. The differences in culture, and every culture really is different because it doesn't matter whether they're neighboring countries, you know, there are still differences just in the way the whole country came together, the way the people in the country, mm -hmm. their attitudes towards things like time and space are some of the biggest conflicts in business. The style of communication, the way we talk, the, the speed at which we talk, the amount of information that we give, all causes so much um, annoyance, uh, grievance, uh, con you know, confusion with one another. And of course, everybody is very quick to jump to a fence, either to take it or to give, uh, to think that it's being given. And you have to learn that it's just a different style of behavior. What would you say that is the biggest difference in style of behavior between our country, which is more relaxed, I would imagine, mm -hmm. than all the other countries that are so formal, because we've got so many different cultures here? Well, what's interesting is that America really is probably the most individualistic country in the world. We're very, very concerned about our own individual freedoms, what we can do. I mean, Dress Down Fridays are a great example of this. It's causing all sorts of um, problems in the workplace today. But we, we want to do things our way. We think our way is the right way. And we're not particularly concerned about how effective we're being with other people, how we're being received. You know, we're just kind of chauvinistic. It's, we're into comfort in our own um, self-satisfaction, I guess. <laughs> and it's not exactly what's going to make you effective in business. And that became a, uh, really apparent back in the 80s when everybody was suddenly talking about globalization. I thought, oh my goodness. <laughs> People have got to learn a few things before they go to other countries. I know because I've made all the mistakes. <laughs> you know, I've made them in every country. So, um, well, you've lived in a number of countries. Let's see, you were right. born in Germany. Mm -hmm. You've lived in Canada, Paris, uh, Milan. London, Milan, um, back in Germany here. Now, how did you um, exactly get into? Etiquette International. How did you start your business? Well, as I just said, I made a lot of mistakes along the way. And I hopefully I learned a few lessons uh, that I want to share. But it's, I realized that one of the big things that was happening in business is that people weren't really being effective. Everybody was gung-ho. They were you know, out to be number one. But they didn't know what they had to do to be effective. And part of that was the McManus generation that, we, that everybody grew up with in the 70s and 80s with mother suddenly working with you know, fast food becoming the norm in the home and that focus on manners was no lo and consideration was no longer part of the way people were raised. Well, I don't think, I find it a lot with old people, but we won't get into that. <laughs> <laughs> you seem so much at ease of speaking of when I've seen you in other places. Has this always come natural to you? No. no. <laughs> Do you have stage um, fright or? No, I, I tend to get a bit um, the creative nervous energy before I go on, but I used to be so shy that I wouldn't look at people, let oh. alone talk to them. I would walk down the street like this, or 
more like this. You're looking for money or the high building? No, just anything so that I didn't have to make eye contact because if I had to make eye contact and they rejected me or they ignored me, oh, you know, I mean, the earth would have to open up and I'd have to fall all the way through to the center of the earth because otherwise you, know, you just couldn't live another day. So you're a little shy, would you a say? <laughs> <laughs> I know we all have a tendency to be shy, but I was morbidly shy. I How did you overcome to, this? A lot of effort, um, really just a lot of effort. And one of the things that happened along the way was that um, somebody told me that other people were just as shy as I was, and they were handling it better. And I thought, ooh, <laughs> what is their a secret? challenge. And so really I set about learning what other people did mm -hmm. to overcome their shyness. And one of the things, in fact, the main thing, and that's what I focus on in the programs that I do, is to focus not on yourself, to focus on the other person. <coughs> Excuse me. Because what happens when you're shy, you go, are they going to like me? Are they, gonna, you know, are they going right. to upset me? Are they going to laugh at me? Am I going to make a fool of myself? Am I going to say something stupid? It's I, 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 me. No. <laughs> and when you're going, I, 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 me, me, you are not focusing on the other person. It's all totally self-involved. And you come across and very selfish, it's self-absorbed. Yeah, it's arrogant, self-absorbed, selfish, uncommunicative, mm. hostile, and there are any number of things. And uh, some people recognize it as shyness as well. But whatever it is, the perceptions are always negative. Oh, great. And so what you have to do is take the focus off yourself and onto the other person where it belongs. Because if I'm focusing on you, on how to make you feel good, first of all, right. I haven't got time to worry about myself all of a sudden and my shyness or my nervousness, um, but I make you feel good and then you respond much better towards me and we start to get a relationship going. And, and everybody's relaxed and it's like a warm, a win-win situation. Exactly. Now how does this hinder a woman in business, her shyness or her public, lack of being comfortable in public speaking? Well women tend to, I think, be more uncomfortable speaking in public than, uh, than men. Partly, and it really is an empowerment issue because by not speaking up in public you're robbing yourself of your own power. What happens, I think, is that women want to be nice, they want mm -hmm. to be liked, they don't want to offend, and I think from from all the books that have uh, been out, like Deborah Tannen's books, um, Men Are From Mars, well, Women Are From Venus, there is a real difference in the way men and women speak, for instance, so women feel uncomfortable interrupting and speaking up because they think it's rude. But men have no or, trouble interrupting oh, no, a woman. No, 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 of course not. <laughs> um, and they don't consider it rude either, but we have to learn to speak up to retain our own power. And we have to learn to speak up and be comfortable with it. How do you do that? Or what's a trick to do that? That women can start well, one now. of the tricks, again, is to pay attention to the other person, to what's Goes being back. said, to contribute. It's always focusing on the other person, what's happening around you, not what's focused, not, well, if I interrupt, are they going to uh, be annoyed at me? So it's back to this, forget the I bit, yes. concentrate oh, on yes. the we bit. Oh, yes. Always. Right. And it does take work. It takes a lot of practice till it becomes automatic behavior. It doesn't happen right away. But it, you, know, you do that in every situation, and after a while, things become a whole lot more interesting as well. But you know, I think it's especially important for women because they tend to suffer from shyness much more than men do. And they tend to be a lot more ineffective as a result. Do you find that this um, shyness is universal or just in America or is it concentrated within women more, like you said, it's more women than men, but is it within different cultures? Cause oh, some cultures are, the women are much more shy than others. Some, uh, many of the Asian cultures, um, because it's not culturally acceptable for a woman to speak up. I mean, they think that the American women are quite bold and crass in many ways <laughs> in those situations. And that's one of the reasons when people go abroad, when women go abroad to do business, I always make sure that they prepare the client that they're doing business with beforehand, that the client knows that they're a woman, that um, they have that shock factor already, and they've overcome that already. And then what happens is, that after a while, they just assume that it's just another American. <laughs> they think we're Americans. You know, they, don't, they can think of us as Americans first and women second. So well, that's that not too bad. Just, no, it, it does have its advantages. Yeah, mm -hmm. because I know. Uh, you meet somebody and it's like, okay, you're a second-class citizen if you're a woman and it doesn't matter where you are, even in America, going to buy a car. You know, it's just recently that the car manufacturers are waking up to the fact that women have got <laughs> buying power oh, and, and uh, they're, you know, redirecting a lot of their ad campaigns. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. There's that one car company has that great uh, one where she was buying the uh, color. Uh, oh, they were right. going on the color of the car in the vanity mirror. Terrific ad. I love that. <laughs> Finally waking up to the power of women. Yay. And definitely. In fact, you mentioned uh, women in communications earlier. Uh, this year, w their theme was the power of women and the power of a woman's voice. So it was particularly appropriate that we met there. Right, right. Now, well, let me ask you about the voice level, because mm -hmm. I know um, if you speak softly, you don't portray power, but yet if you talk too loud, you're overbearing. Is there a certain point that you can talk at a, a level that... Well, I think part of that is the vocal level that you're speaking at. Very often, women, when they get nervous, they tend to talk very high, and their voices are sort of like that, and right. so they don't have the same projection. You can talk softly if your voice is lower, and you can take that down by breathing exercises. There, I've learned a number of them over the years. In fact, I would recommend that any woman who does find it difficult to speak in public, who is shy, that she find a presentation skills trainer and work with that uh -huh. person to get over some of those. I've worked with a number of them for years, <laughs> and I've learned some fabulous tricks as a result. But you really can. You can bring your voice level down by getting that diaphragm to start working, the breathing, and just doing a few vocal exercises beforehand. That gets you self-centered and mm -hmm. calm and cool. Mm -hmm. like, I know um, I'm always nervous with my shows and I'm always the adrenaline's running and my guests say oh I'm so nervous I'm so nervous and I said don't worry about it I'll be nervous for both of us you know it's like they know the subject matter I don't I'm finding out my innate curiosity is always asking questions mm -hmm. and it's like okay you can relax you've got the knowledge let me just pick your brain mm -hmm. and so forth now with different cultures is there handshake I know a handshake says so much about people oh yes now, how is it different in different cultures? Well, part of it is uh, the number of shakes. Part of it is the firmness of the handshake. For instance, when you're dealing with Asian cultures, because Asian cultures, for the most part, aren't touch cultures, they'll have a much softer handshake. Oh, really? And the American perception right away will be, ooh, fishy handshake. Exactly. They're weak. Right. And it doesn't have anything to do with weakness in that case at all. That's a cultural difference. Oh, Now, if an American were giving you a handshake like that, Weak. <laughs> Weak. Um, no backbone. Huh? No, none whatsoever, exactly. Very fishy, uh, limp. Right. And so you do have to learn to, hand, uh, to shake hands well. And I think, again, women are somewhat uncomfortable shaking hands. And they oh. tend, what happens is they tend to do that. And they go in with a closed hand. Well, it's really hard to get in there and get a handshake. Right. Now, you have to keep that hand open. This, we have these webs, just like ducks. And in a good handshake, the webs meet. Keep your thumb. It's I come in peace is what that open hand means. Oh, really? That's why it's so effective. And you oh, get those webs touching, and then just wave, wrap your hands around. And then one or two shakes from the elbow. Oh. Now, one of the things as well that happens, of course, is that uh, suddenly you've got somebody to hold on to. <laughs> You're just popping away like this. Oh, yeah, I'm not going to let go. And uh, in a culture like France, for instance, that is terribly gauche. Oh, really? Because really, they'd shake one hand. That's it. That's they, it. One shake. That's it. Very clean, neat. And so it's you like, do tell a lot from a person. Now, what about the Americans? I mean, what's the proper handshake? I know I shook a hand with a woman, and I've got a strong, firm handshake, and she almost broke my hand, and I've never felt that way. I was like, whoa, let me stay away from this woman. She's very overbearing and powerful, and yet when you look at her physique, she is, mm -hmm. and that's what she's all about. But still, it's like you want to distance yourself from somebody like that. Oh, without a doubt. And that's, we, you were asking about women and speaking out in public and the empowerment issue. One of the things that happens very often is that women tend to go overboard, mm. and they tend to be too aggressive, too firm, and, you know, I can oh, play with the big boys. And this isn't about playing with the big boys. It's about being sophisticated, gracious, savvy, and making the other person feel good. And it's amazing, in the last few weeks, I've read a number of descriptions about people. And one of the things that people, that writers seem to be focusing on these days is they were so elegant, they were so gracious, they made people feel so good, they, their manners were so impeccable. It, I'm beginning to feel as though there's a resurgence all of Sounds a sudden. Great. Or there's an awareness of the need, or whatever it is. Shits <laughs> out the people in the subway. <laughs> <laughs> Territorial <laughs> rights. It's, you know, um, it's like, wow. Uh, it's, one of the papers down south, and I'm trying to remember the city, was either Louisville or St. Louis, 
recently, and I said that incorrectly, I didn't say that like Diane, sorry I did, but they recently got a subway system and they interviewed oh. me for an article on proper subway. Oh, no back. Yes, that was one of the articles they did in preparation to the opening of the subway. Oh, how wonderful. So they're probably better behaved than New Yorkers are. <laughs> it always amazes me. You're trying to get off the subway car and people are pushing on and they don't let you get off. I mean, it's like, don't wait for me to get off, just walk right through mm -hmm. me. Or, you know, I'll bump into you and don't say excuse me, and it's, I've got this great bearing voice when I say excuse me, and everybody <laughs> stops, you know, and it's like, oh, and then they'll apologize. I mean, they can just just jam into you, and it's like, you're nothing. Yeah, it's true. It's like, and terrible. again, it's a total uh, disregard for the other person. And it, 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 that type of behavior mushrooms. It, you start off nudging one person, that person gets annoyed, and they take it out on the next person. And it's like a geometric progression during the course of the day. And at the end of the day, everybody's tense and frustrated. <laughs> and they, they want to go at each other. And again, they're focusing on themselves. They're not focusing on other people. Now, there's a lot that's happening with the American Disability Act. Yes. Can we discuss some of that? I mean, it's like... Oh, please. Okay. One of the things I always find, I do, and I don't know how many else, how many other people in the audience do that, but when you're talking to a person who's hard of hearing or deaf, I always seem to raise my voice. And I... It, it's it's going to make you hear <laughs> yeah, <right>? yeah. <laughs> And I said, Barry, they can't hear you. What are you raising your voice for? And, or you meet somebody in a wheelchair, or you see somebody in a wheelchair on the streets of New York. Mm -hmm. What is the proper way to handle that? I don't think we've ever been schooled or taught that. I mean, it's becoming more and more and more, more, and more important since the ADA Act, uh, was passed. But one of the things that I find most interesting, you, know, you said raising your voice with somebody who's, uh, who has a hearing disability, is that people um, speak, they raise their voice when they're speaking to someone who's blind. <laughs> you have a hearing disability. Yeah, the eyes and the ears aren't, yeah, they're in the same head, but they work independently of one another. Um, when you're speaking to someone who has a hearing disability, you want to make sure that you're facing them directly, mm -hmm. and you want to speak more slowly so uh -huh. that you're clearer. And if anything, you want to just bring down the register of your voice rather than to raise it up because if they d if they can hear partially they can usually hear the lower decibels uh, more easily than the higher decibels. Oh that's interesting because my grandmother when her hearing was failing she could hear my mother but mm -hmm. she could never hear me mm -hmm. until I would lower my voice. Exactly. Same thing. And when you're speaking to somebody who's in a wheelchair, I've seen people stand for 15, 20 minutes or longer speaking to someone in a wheelchair. They're standing, the person's sitting down, and the neck is like this, and you know that that person needs a neck massage so badly <laughs> after that conversation. <laughs> well, how, I mean, if there's no Sit chair. Down. But if there's no chair around. How do you handle that? Do you st uh, stoop to talk to the my level? I wouldn't. No, I wouldn't stoop. That's a bit awkward. But uh, try to find something that you can perch yourself on. Not the person's wheelchair, though, because that really is an extension of themselves. That's the, like that's the replacement for their legs. And so you never ever sit on the person's wheelchair. And you see people doing that all the time too. Sit on a wheelchair? On the Whoa. arm of the wheelchair, they'll just plop themselves there and start chatting with you. Oh, for heaven's sakes! And that's uh, you know, the person has no control then. They've really lost control. Mm -hmm. Now, well, if you meet, some, you see somebody on the street. How do you do? You acknowledge them? Do you? I mean, how do you acknowledge? You don't really ignore them. I mean, no, they're you speak looking to them directly. That's okay. the, that's another thing that happens so often. People will speak to uh, uh, through another person to the person who has a disability. Oh, well, that's rude. Which is so rude. If you know, a person's there with well, somebody in a wheelchair and somebody who's not wheelchair bound, they'll speak to the person who's not wheelchair bound and. I'd speak of the person sitting there in the third person. It's unbelievably rude. <laughs> People just don't think. I mean, how would they feel if they're sitting there and they're being talked around? Oh, good heavens. I mean, this is wild. It's amazing the little things that we do. And it really is a little things mean a lot of business that I'm in. But they can be your undoing, both socially and in business, and especially internationally. <laughs> yeah, because everybody's traveling so much more, and this ADA stuff is really heightening the awareness of the American public. Sure. I mean, we're very fortunate because when you go over to Europe, I mean, people are handicapped more so over there because of all the different wars. If I can ask a favor, mm -hmm. um, I would really like to see that word handicap exonerated from the dictionary, or deleted from the dictionary. How did it start? Um, from my research into the word, it started back, I believe, in the 18th or 19th century when somebody who did have a disability would have to go around cap in hand to beg for survival. Uh -huh. And it has a very negative connotation for somebody who has to beg for survival. And I don't think that 
gives the person who has a disability their full due. And also, when you speak of somebody with a disability, it's a, the person with the disability, not the disabled person. <laughs> you know? Makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. Let's just go back to the plate and the champagne oh, glass. Sure. Let's just do this. this sorry. I do have this illustrated in my book, if somebody does oh. catch this, by the way. Mm -hmm. You want to show your book since you oh, have it here? Sure. It's at ease professionally. An etiquette it guide is. for the business arena. Here and abroad. Oh, great. And it was published by Bonus Books oh. uh, out of Chicago. So it is available through bookstores still. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Now, did you get a shot of it? or? Okay. All right. The trick. Okay, I've got it's a champagne very simple. and a plate. When you're like that, you're not available to shake hands at right. all. So what you want to do is you take the napkin in between your ring and your baby finger. Okay. You take the plate and put it on your ring and middle finger and these two fingers on top and the glass here. That's fabulous. So then I meet you, I am free to shake hands. I can nibble from my plate here. I can take my napkin and blot my mouth as long as I remember to put everything back. I can take a sip from my champagne and it works with other glasses as well. Let me show with this glass here because it's not, it doesn't work just with stem glasses, but you can do it with a low ball or a high ball glass as well. And it works very effectively. Now, of course, it means that you put less on your plate at your <laughs> dues bar, but there's nothing wrong with that. It's good for our figures, and also it looks so tacky when people overload their plates. Right, because it's falling off oh, and it falls onto you. I mean, it's just like, whoa, okay. Also, it gives you a reason to go back and back and meet more people <laughs> who are standing around the And table. show them how to do the plate and the cup routine. <laughs> well, actually, usually I don't go around and tell people that, but you looked receptive to it, and you looked as though you wanted some assistance there, but normally you don't go around and correct people. That's well, that's true, but bad it's, that would be bad mannered on my part uh, too. So well, it's interesting because I said, "Oh, let me help you. Let me show you something I've learned," mm -hmm. and people are very receptive to that. Mm -hmm. So it's just like, "Oh, I learned this great thing. Let me show." <laughs> <laughs> and it it's is been a, a lot of fun. What other little nuances have you learned through the years or developed yourself that you would like to share with the audience? Well, one of those situations where people, especially I think women, are so uncomfortable and insecure is in these networking situations, any kind of cocktail party. And again, you have to go find somebody to talk to. The fact that you're both there, that right away you have a common ground. You don't have to worry about whether there's something there or not. And the trick that I used to do uh, myself when I first started to put myself in these situations was to pretend that I was the hostess, that this was my party. And I would go over to people and try to make them feel comfortable. Oh, interesting. I pretended it was my living room, you were, uh, you were my guest, and I came over to make you feel comfortable. Uh, are you enjoying yourself? Are you having a good time? You know, why, why, uh, what brought you here today? Oh, your glass is empty. Should we go get another glass of wine or soda or whatever? So you look at, you know, I started, I started to go around looking after people. And That's a great way. And after a while, you forget about yourself. You do forget about yourself because you're thinking about the other person. And I'm and sure they're appreciative, especially if they're a shy person exactly. also. And most people, I think, are uncomfortable in those situations. But the thing to remember, you see, is that we can only hold one thought in our brains <laughs> at one time. And so the moment we take that thought off of ourselves and put it on the other person, right away we've helped ourselves in doing that. And we've expanded. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you about business cards. I know in Japan you're supposed to hold it and present it with two hands. They have a very, very um, set way in which you uh, exchange business cards and when you exchange business cards, it's called the exchange of Meiji. But what Meiji? you Meiji, M E I J I. But um, what you don't want to do here is hand out business cards like they're flyers. You, know, you see these people <laughs> on street corners handing out flyers to everybody comes along. And you see that so often, people doing that. And then people will take the other person's card and, you know, oh, my memory's terrible. Let me just make a note here about you know, what you said or, you know, so I'll remember who you are. Right. I have to write a note on my business card to remember who I am. Give it back <laughs> to me. <laughs> really, it's. Um, Can you walk away and write the note or as long as you don't do it in front definitely. of them? Definitely. Oh, certainly. And I do that all the time because I have a memory like a sieve. But you wait until you've said your goodbyes and then you sort of turn around, and walk away, and discreetly <laughs> write a little note on the card before you tuck it away. But you don't do that in front of them, and you see that happening all the time. And you see people handing out dog-eared cards, dirty cards. 
you also see people asking for uh, cards all the time, and you never ask for a card from someone who has a much higher position than you. How do you know if the person has a much higher position than you? Well, first of all, you don't hand out cards right away. Oh, you okay. start talking to the person. Getting together at networking situations is about making relationships. It's about conversing, and you find out information that way. Their address, I can figure that out. If I get them in the conversation and find out where they're working, I'll look, up, I'll look it up in the yellow pages. Oh, okay. But it's more important for me to establish a relationship, get them to feel comfortable in my presence, then I have a reason to call them the next day because I'll find out information about them and they'll want to talk to me because I listen to them. Ah. Mm. As long as you're not selling two one. Two and one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well that's really great because you know, women are so bad at networking, which is really a very big shame. I mean, I just, I suggest let's network or whatever and people at me uh, at a gas because it's like, how can you do something? You can't give out your business card or, you know, if I want to say here, I'd love to hear from you. Here's my card. Perfect. But this is the, towards the end of the conversation, not the very, right. not the opening sentence. <laughs> no, because so. then again, if there's somebody on the other side of the room, you say, here, I want to, here, I'd love to talk to you more, but I've got to meet somebody at the other end of the room. I mean, it's kind of like. Also, well, everybody wants to talk to you because you have your own TV show. <laughs> well, that's so uh, that makes a big, big difference there. But, um, the other, another tip, by the way, with, with in working around a room and working a room, mm -hmm. is to go against the flow of traffic. Ah. Because what happens, and most of us tend to be right-handed, we tend to drift towards the right side of the room. And so if you follow everybody around the right, you're looking at everybody's back. It's very hard to start to make eye contact and get people involved in a conversation. Clever. So if you walk against the flow of traffic, you'll be meeting people face to face all the time and you'll be able to make eye contact and smile, make a comment, start talking. Oh, I can't wait to go out and try all this. <laughs> this is fantastic. <laughs> but I thank you so much, Alka, for joining us. And we've got to pick up your book, At Ease Professionally. Thank this you. is fabulous. And let me just hold it up again so we can get a good view on this one. And I really appreciate you coming and giving us all these it's wonderful been my pleasure. Helps, thank helpful you. hints. Thank you. Love to hear from you. Please write me. It's because of people like you that allow people like me to have a television show. I can be reached at the Women's Connection, Ansonia Station, Post Office Box 918, New York, New York, 10023. Thank you for joining us.